So let me give you um, just a quick introduction on this series. And so I don't know, many of you are part of the Bay City family. Some of you have found Bay City for the first time. And uh, I, I wanted to, to provide some context for a series like this because I think you know, maybe man, many of us are going to come and be thinking something specific about what they're going to hear in regards to these 11 questions. And by the way, like Christy said, if you are interested in knowing what the series questions will be, you can pick up some cards at the back and uh, please take a whole stack and we'll, those, that'll have all of the information uh, of, which one, of what topics we're going to walk through. But essentially, I'm going to seek to respond to 11 specific questions about religion, faith, Jesus, and the Bible. And my responses to these uh, I, I hope that they're edifying for all of us, that we grow together, whether you, know, you consider yourself a Christian or whether you don't. Uh, I, I think that the, our answers to these will be edifying for all of us, that we will grow together, that we can learn some things together. Now, my answers to these questions, or actually I want to say responses to these questions, I, we won't have time to answer uh, all of these questions up here, but I do think that um, in, in our city groups this week and in the coming weeks and also in your personal conversations, that there will be time for you to... Um, discuss these questions and hopefully come to resolutions for these questions over the course of a few weeks, months, and Lord willing, days and minutes. That would be awesome. But I don't think I'm, we're going to get to the point where we're going to respond or rather answer everything. So I'll call these responses through, through the preaching of the word. And these responses, I think, will hopefully speak, spark these conversations. I, I, I've got many friends. Many of you know my story. I, I didn't grow up uh, in the church and none of my, and very few of my family members are believers. And so I hope these will spark questions with them as well and that we will be able to dialogue. And so our hope is that you would be resourced with the, for those questions, that you wouldn't only think that these are the only means by which God's going to kind of reveal the question to you, but that your conversations over the course of weeks and months will help bring those about. And so that's why we put together the resource page for you to be able to go to and have some good books that you can read and, and study that might help bring some more clarity on some of these as well. Again, my responses as well will be rooted in a text from Scripture. So today is John 3.16. Through 19, it, it's going to be rooted in Scripture, and I and I hope that the Christian message will help bring a little bit cl a clarity to some of the these questions. Some of them are directly about Christianity. Um, I, I do hope, though, that the Word of God is ultimately our answer and resource. And so my tone won't be, um, you know, I, I want to say I don't want to say it's not going to be apologetic, but it's not going to be uh, factual. You know, I'm not going to only regurgitate facts, regurgitate facts to you. Although there will be some facts. I hope that the tone, it takes the tone of the text and that's a bit more pastoral and we have much to learn in, in, in emotionally as well as uh, mentally in these topics. And so uh, I hope that you will give me some grace. Uh, these are difficult questions to answer, um, but that also that God might fall here and that um, anything that man has to say here would be rejected, but then anything that God wants to be said would, would ultimately come to pass by the power of the Spirit. So uh, that being said, uh, I'm going to pray one more time just for blessing on this series and for this sermon, and then we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, it's, it's not lost on me the privilege it is to, to preach your word, to open your scriptures, and to have your power emanate from them. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit does his work today, that everything that wants to happen, that he wants to happen here today does, and that he rests in here amongst us, Lord God. So would the Spirit come and rest and open hearts and minds. Many of us come different places, different seasons of our life. So, Lord God, I do pray for the spirit to rest. I pray for um, some of us have resistance in our spirit towards questions like these. That's why we're here. And so, Lord, I do pray for our walls to come down a bit as we walk through this, Lord. And I do pray for grace um, for everyone here that we get an extra measure of that today as we try to wrestle through top, tough topics. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so you can unlock your Bibles now or open them. You know, I prefer to open my Bible. Uh, you can unlock yours. Uh, we're going to answer this question, or rather respond to this question. Don't all religions lead to the same path? And this question is birthed out of some of the conversations that I have had with people who have said this. I, I just told you a lot of my family, uh, a lot of my friends, they're, they're not Christians. And so I've literally had this question asked to me a few times. And so the goal is that we would, I would respond to this question. It's often asked, but here's what's interesting about it. Sometimes Christians can get in uh, in this kind of adversarial mode, this def you know, there's a word, uh, making a defense of the faith, the word there is apologia, apologia. We want to make a defense for the faith. That's where the word apologetics comes from. And we get, you know, kind of, we start grabbing our shields and stuff. And, but sometimes not everyone's coming after the word. Sometimes they just want to come to understand it a little better. And so some people will ask it thinking, you know, actually, I think religion as a whole, whether whatever religion is, is actually a good thing. I, I think religion's a good thing. I think it's meaningful for society. Even though I don't partake of it myself, I, I think it's a good thing. And so 
I would imagine they probably all fundamentally teach the same thing. You know, that's, some people probably are thinking that. Some people probably haven't thought deeply about this question at all, and that may be you. You actually haven't really thought about this question. And so I'm just kind of saying, hey, they probably lead to the same path. It makes sense, right? Don't they basically have the same kind of morals and principles? And yeah, some people will ask it condescendingly, but not everyone is coming to this question with negativity, okay? Not everyone is doing that. Now, regardless of where we're at in our faith and what you think about this question, in our faith, religion, belief, I think we're really seeking to answer four truths about our lives. All of us are seeking to answer four main truths. And here, here they are. The first one is origin. W- the origin, where did I come from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, how I should live, how should I live? Destiny, where am I headed? Now, you may be under, I don't know, 12 years old if you haven't thought about all these. Um, But I think most of us have, right? We've all kind of considered. Wherever you find yourself today, you've considered, hey, which one, where do I come from? Like, why am am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? And man, what happens when I die, right? We're, We're all thinking through that. Now, in order to find these four truths, we can agree that in America probably has come to this, has come to a solution for this based on our question. And so when we ask America, do all lead, religions lead to the same path, as a whole, it's my belief that America would probably say, yes, generally speaking, if you live a good life, all of them probably lead to the same path, okay? I would think America might say that as a whole. Now, not obviously not individually, but maybe corporately, that's kind of the, the ethos of the city, or of, sorry, of the country. It's certainly the ethos of our city here in San Francisco. But it is my position that that particular answer will not lead us to a clear understanding of our basic four uh, questions here. We will not get a, I don't think we're gonna learn with clarity our origin, our meaning, our morality, or our destiny. I don't think that will happen if we answer the question, do all religions lead to the same path with yes, they do. I I don't believe that will happen, and I hope to explain that here today. In fact, I think actually a lack of a solid answer and a solid foundation for do all religions lead to the same path actually leads to the exact opposite of what we're looking for. I think it actually leads to uh, more anxiety, more depression, more uncertainty, and more uneasiness. I actually think that humanity, in its attempt to answer our question with a yes, has actually found itself incredibly more anxious and incredibly more scared and afraid for what the future might hold for us and the present. And so what it causes some of us to do is to retreat, we get scared, we get fearful, retreat out of culture, and it causes some of us to grab our shields and to go into culture, into battle, and to wage war on culture, right? You've seen that maybe in the news. So answering this question has led to a lack of clarity in life and really a spotty definition for our origin, certainly our meaning, morality, and destiny. And as a, kind of to evidence what I'm talking about here, there's a new phenomenon in psychology over the last few years called terror management theory. Has anyone heard of terror management theory? Well, terror management theory, I'll I'll give you the definition here from psychology today, attempts to explain a type of defense, a defense of human thinking and behavior that stems from an awareness and fear of death. Okay, so what I mean here is that people are realizing they can die, that there will, they are finite, there will be an end to them, and they're starting to get really, really anxious. Okay, so according to TMT, Death anxiety drives people to adopt worldviews that protect their sense of self-esteem, worthiness, sustainability, and allow them to believe that they can play an important role in society. Here's what that means. If we don't know the truth about life, if we're not unsure what happens when we die or how we should live, we begin to fashion for ourselves ways of achievement and accomplishment that bring us meaning. And so you actually see this quite often in, in the arts, or you see that with with actors and actresses where the, 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 uh, the pinnacle of life has become winning an Oscar or a Tony Award, right? You see that in sports where the pinnacle of life has become winning a sports trophy. And so people will fashion for themselves some sort of thing that brings meaning and, that, and the hope is that they would leave some sort of lasting legacy behind. So you see this even with us. So many of us will climb the corporate ladder. We will, um, it's not bad to climb the corporate ladder. I'm just saying that's sometimes we substitute that for the most important thing in our lives. And so we'll climb the corporate ladder. Where our, our meaning is found in the amount of money we uh, acquire, our 401ks, our bank accounts, the relationships we make, the boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife that we find. And all of a sudden, that is the most important thing in our lives. And here is, um, here is a little bit more of a definition here from Psychology Today. It says, terror management theory, or TMT, 
proposes that individuals are motivated to develop quote, or close relationships within their own culture group in order to feel immortal, to convince themselves that they will somehow live on, if only symbolically, symbolically after their inevitable death. And so people will fashion for themselves abilities to create legacy through financial means, through winning, uh, breaking a world record, or through leaving music behind, or whatever it may be, a piece of art. And then their goal is that they could somehow live on, right? And so you see outside of sports venues, they'll, they'll put statues of athletes, you know what I mean? And statue means that your legacy will live on even after you die. But I'll be honest with you, when I learn about this, this doesn't bring me a lot of comfort, okay? I actually cr- pretty creeped out and anxious about this, actually. It, it kind of scares me, and that's the point of terror management theory, is that there's a terror, anxiety, and depression that comes with seeing life as a bleak end. And so when we answer the question, do all religions lay in the same path, and we haven't thought deeply about it, and we say, yeah, sure, but we haven't thought deeply, we start to feel this terror creep in and go, well, is that really true about life? Have I really studied the depths of this? Now, I think there is a way out of this terror for all of us. I do, and we're going to get there. But in order to look at our our question with better clarity, I want to tell you a little bit about how the Bible sees Christianity as, as it relates to origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, okay? And so John 3.16, if you've got your Bible unlocked or open, um, it says this, For God so loved the world, many of you heard this, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, this used to be called the great end zone verse because, I don't know, was it the 80s or 90s? People used to hold up John 3.16 in the end zones, and now it's kind of obnoxious to do, I guess, and people don't do it as much anymore. But it used to be a thing. But I, it's my understanding that this, this verse helps us grasp the four core uh, things we're all seeking in life. So we have origin. We hear that or, our origin is that we come from God, meaning... In Christianity, we are here to, glory, to glorify God and enjoy him in all of his creation. Morality, we live how Jesus wants us to live because Jesus gives us the best way for life. He, when, we, when we listen to what Jesus says, we're essentially getting the best way to do life, right? So, for instance, if we've created a, um, a pot, right, for instance, the, the maker of the pot knows what's best for the pot and how it's supposed to be used because they understand its integrity and its functioning. And then we see the destiny, we see that here at the end of John 3, 16, that we will live, that we, those who are in Christ that believe in Jesus, will be with him forever in his perfect, renewed creation. And so we get answers to these questions. Now, someone, someone who maybe believes that all religion lead to the same path, some of us in here, right? We will have to look at this a specific way. We'll have to think one or two things about this. Either all religions believe what Christianity believes right here, that Jesus Christ is the way to, to achieve salvation and to, to live a, in a better life and renewed creation, or that Christianity maybe has got some parts partially right and some of them partially wrong, and that there's this big kind of goulash gumbo pot. You know, my family's from New Orleans, and uh, my, my aunt, uh, I used to go over to her house, and she would make gumbo, which as an eight-year-old, it was nasty. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you. Like, I wasn't big into sea bugs, like shrimp and scallops, like, that just kind of turned me off as an eight-year-old. But there's everything in there. You got sausage and peppers, and so there's all these different things. And so what this view is saying, essentially, is you take a big ladle of gumbo, and you put it in your cup, and sometimes you got a little shrimp, and sometimes you got a little bit of onions, but you never really get everything the gumbo has to offer in one spoonful. You know what I'm saying? Some of you people are like, I've never had gumbo. What's gumbo? What's a, you Google, you're, on def, you're defining it, right? Oh, what is that? You know, <laughs> I see people like, gumbo, looking at their wife. What? Um, it's a big goulash of food, Okay. And so maybe this view would, would say that Christianity's got some of the ingredients and other, these other religions have some of the ingredients, right? Now, I want to lead you into some of the logic behind this thinking. And many, some of you have heard this, uh, this example used here in, in regards to this question. So let me read to you uh, an illustration that will help us understand this viewpoint. So several blind men fall into a pit. Maybe you've heard this. An elephant happens to be in that pit. So the blind men begin to argue what they've discovered. Grabbing the tusk, one says, wow, this feels like a spear. Uh, Grabbing the tail, another says, no, this is a rope. Feeling the elephant's side, another says, no, it's like a wall. And someone maybe grabs the ear and is like, well, this is a really floppy fan. (laughs) You know, it's it's something, okay? And so essentially the point is clear. Someone who gives this uh, this, uh, example, the illustration, the point is clear that 
we are all essentially blind men groping in the dark, and God is the elephant. And we've got to stop being so narrow-minded and dogmatic and open up our minds a little bit, right? Now, some of you think, yeah, that makes a ton of sense, and I, 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 I'm with you on that. However, I think there are three key issues with this logic that lead us to answer that question incorrectly, why do all, do all religions lead to the same path, okay? And we will state these issues and allow our passage, John three sixteen through 19, uh, allow it to bring clarity on the truth. So the first issue that we see with this analogy is the omniscience issue, the omniscience issue. That essentially means that you have the, the perspective to see everything, okay? To answer this analogy, we often say like something like this, like we don't have the full picture, you know, it's, we only have part of the picture, and we're all kind of looking for God. And, and that's true, right? M- many of us will say that, and we'll say, man, I feel like Islam has a picture, Judaism has a picture, Mormonism has a picture, um, New Ageism, uh, the Baha'i faith, Hindu, we all have just a different piece, and we're all grasping at the same thing. Now, all perspectives lead to the same path has one ser- ser- serious flaw with this, in order to see the elephant, you have to have what you say no one else can have, right? You have to have clear vision and omniscience on what exactly is taking place. So you have to know there's blind men, you have to know there's a pit, and you have to know there's an elephant, all of which the people in the pit can't know. But the person saying that is saying, I do know that. So what you're really saying is, if you could only see what I would see, then you would know the truth and that you're wrong, right? Uh, there was a uh, a, a missionary in India for some time named Leslie Newbegin. Maybe you've heard of him. And he wrote a book called The Gospel in a Pluralist Society, which I recommend to you. It's a great book. But India, I was just there a few months ago, and it's got so many different cultures. There's several versions of Hinduism. There are several million different gods in Hinduism. There's also the Baha'i faith and Islam and Catholicism and Christianity kind of all rolled into one among other religions. And so he was a missionary here, and he often would hear this exact analogy. So this is his answer to that analogy, and it'll be here on the board. In the famous story of the blind man and the elephant, so often quoted in interest of religious agnosticism, the real point of the story is constantly overlooked. The story is told from the point of view that the king and his courtiers are not blind, but can see that the blind men are unable to grasp the full reality of the elephant and are only able to get a hold of a part of the truth. The story is constantly told in order to neutralize the affirmation of the great religions, to suggest that they all learn humility and recognize that none of them can have uh, more than one aspect of truth. Of co- but of course, Newbegin says, the real point of the story is exactly the opposite. If the king were also blind, there would be no story. The story is told by the king and it is immensely arrogant claim of one who sees the full truth which all the world's religions are only growing, groping after. You see what Mr. Newbegin is saying here? He's saying that if the analogy is true, the person who made the analogy also doesn't have the truth as well. So actually, the analogy breaks down when someone can describe the analogy. It breaks down. Unless, of course, you say, yes, I, do, I am the one that has the truth. So there is an omniscience issue. So if, if, if that's your viewpoint... We're, I love you. I'm so happy you're here. I would love for you to come down a notch and join us all and as we explain kind of some of these other parts of this analogy and in Christianity. So the next issue is not the omniscience issue. It's the uh, logical issue. It's a logical issue. Now, I believe there is a, a significant logic problem with answering the question, yes, all religions lead to the same path. In, in fact, it's my, it's my, uh, my opinion that it's impossible to study any of these religions that we discuss here, uh, any of them, even for a short amount of time, comparing them to others, and claim that all the religions essentially lead the same direction. I think on an honest 20-minute study would reveal to you that that probably isn't true. Uh, that's, that's what I believe. Now, certainly there are paralleling beliefs in some religions, you might say. We might say that there are you know, fundamental beliefs of brotherhood and sisterhood in, in humanity, and um, maybe morality and such and such. You may believe that, but, but all of the things, everything, all of them leading to the same path. That's interesting. I, I, someone was, we were having this conversation this week uh, with, uh, with, a, with a friend at a, a conference, and he said, just kind of posed this question, 
um, just kind of for fun. And I just said, well, like, what happens when you die in each religion? And this incredibly smart person, smarter than me, like way smarter than me, started to list off what happens after you die in all these religions. And he kept going. I'm like, there's that many religions? Like, man, I don't know if I'm ready to talk about this. And he just kept going and going and going. And so he, he even just, in, even in that quick analogy, he was able to say, listen, they all actually lead somewhere different. Some of them believe in a salvation, meaning that you're saved by something. Some of those believe that you're saved by yourself. Some of them believe that you're uh, saved by some sort of transcendent force. Some of them believe in reincarnation, that when you die, you actually come back based on the life you lived before. You come back either at a higher or lower level. And some of them also believe in annihilationism, which is that when you die, nothing happens. You essentially cease to exist, not just in body, but also in spirit. So uh, Dr. Norman Geisler and Dr. Frank Turek, these, uh, they, they, they list a few big differences in these world religions. I want to re- give you a couple of them. Geisler, by the way, is a PhD in philosophy, uh, had a, has a PhD in philosophy at Loyola. And Frank Turek, Dr. Frank Turek, holds his doctor of ministry from Southern Evangelical St- uh, Seminary. And so they, they break a couple of these down for us. So, so one of the things they say is that Jews, Christians, and Muslims believe different versions of a theistic God. So those are different versions of a theistic God. While most Hindus and New Agers believe that everything exists as part of an impersonal, pantheistic force they call God. And by the way, pantheism is this belief that God is the summation of all of creation, the spiritual and the physical, and so they kind of unite. And so God maybe is a transcendent force, but that also includes everything. So everything is God, kind of, you've seen Avatar, kind of like that, right? Plug your tail into the tree and boom, power up. It's like charging your iPhone, kind of that kind of thing. You get what I'm saying? So that's kind of some of the beliefs that those, that those folks have. Many Hindus believe that evil is a complete illusion. Not all, but many do. While Christians, Muslims, and Jews believe that evil is very real, very real. Christians believe that people are saved by grace, meaning you don't earn your own salvation, that God gives it to you by his grace and grace alone. While other religions, if they do teach a salvation, teach a works-based righteousness, meaning your actions and behaviors are what essentially earn your way into a good, right standing with God, and so therefore you are taken into God's presence because you did well on earth, right? Something like Mormonism would follow that. And by the way, the definitions of good and heaven also vary quite differently over the course of those religions. And then finally, Satanists. Satanists believe that the human instinct is the chief uh, operator of man, that we should ultimately yield to everything that our human instinct teaches us. While Christianity and Judaism teach that the human instinct is actually morally corrupt and cannot be trusted, and that God is something necessary for humans to, to eventually steer their way into God's presence. See? Now, I've kind of given you some breakdowns. There is a million of these things. If you would pick up any book on this, you will find many different subjects. Uh, There are a couple on our resources page. I encourage you to read those. But if you want to know more, there is plenty of these different examples. But next, I want to look at the logic of our text in John 3.16 here for a second. So John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, right, spiritual death, but have eternal life. Now, this is a tremendously powerful statement. That's why Christianity always looks to this statement to explain the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that God would send his son into the world, himself, in the flesh, and that whoever would believe in him, his name, would not die but have eternal life. Now, Christianity is perhaps the most inclusive religion and exclusive religion at the same time. So it's inclusive in that whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. But it's exclusive in that whoever believes should have eternal life. So in order for, it's exclusive in the sense that this word belief shows up. Believe. Now there's little wiggle, there's little wiggle room in, in this word believe to, to kind of shoehorn in any other worldviews. Very little wiggle room, even in Christianity. Very little wiggle room. It's just hard to find. But we must take this world's word seriously because if we don't have this word, then the rest of the statement here is null and void. It's great that God did all that, but what's the contingency on it? What, what, how, do I, how do I engage it? Well, you have to believe. So we have to take it seriously. Jesus says, believe in me and you will, and you will be saved. Now, this is not a, big, a vague belief. This isn't a pseudo-belief. This isn't a belief in the back of your mind as you live life. This is a volitional, intentional decision and belief to live and follow according to 
the words and the actions and examples of Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. So this is an actually really important step. Um, just simply knowing it's true is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about engaging it at an encountering level where you personally are transformed by God. So just saying, Jesus is alive, that, that, that's not necessarily what we're talking about. Many non-Christian statistical and archaeological resources have confirmed Jesus that he, that he did live and that he did die and that he possibly did resurrect. But if they weren't believers, that's not what we're talking about here. So there is an exclusive nature to Christianity here. So the logic of Christianity says that in order to be an ultimate relationship with God, you must believe in Jesus as the resurrected son of God and the God of the Bible himself and that God would bear sin on our behalf. Judaism does not teach this. Judaism teaches that Jesus is not the Messiah, that maybe he was a, I actually heard, uh, I heard a, a popular Jewish um, radio, was a radio host, political radio host, actually called Jesus a, a, a militant uh, riot starter, that he actually wasn't, uh, and that's why he was killed. He was killed because he proclaimed to be God, but also that there were people around him causing all sorts of problems because of who he was. And so, they would, and so some Jews, believe, the Jew, uh, people that are Jewish today, would say that Jesus is not the Messiah. All of them would say that he is not the Messiah, that we're actually still waiting on this saving Messiah that we hear about in the Old Testament. Islam does not believe that Jesus is the resurrected God of the Bible either. Islam believes Je uh, Jesus was a, a, a great prophet. He was important to the Islamic faith, but he's not God himself. We also know that Buddhism doesn't believe that. New Ageism doesn't believe that. Confucianism doesn't believe that. Certainly secular humanism, most of America today, doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Son of God, that we would worship him and be in relationship with him. Now, there's a whole lot of differing perspectives on Jesus here, but one thing's for sure, Christianity rises and falls on Jesus. And so if you want to disprove Christianity, disprove the resurrection, because if you disprove the resurrection, then we have, the, we have nothing. In fact, the Bible says, if Jesus never died and did not raise from the dead, then we're still in our sins and we're all, to, we're all to be pitied among all. And that's true, we should be. But we do believe that Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. And so, if you're here and you're seeking Christianity, you're seeking a religion or faith, I would say, ask you the question, did Jesus rise from the dead? Spend all of your time trying to answer that question. You can compare and contrast other religions if you want, but if this dude rose from the dead, that's kind of a trump card. You know what I mean? I rose from the dead, I mean... It's kind of proof, you know what I mean? So explore that. There are so many different contradictions, but explore that. And so we, we know by listening to all these, and we know even just, through, even just through philosophy and logic, that the law of non-contradiction has to apply to reality. This means that two contradictory statements cannot both be true at the same time. Cannot both be true at the same time. So I'm either standing on the stage or I'm not, right? Someone would say, well, I think you're standing on the stage. And then someone would say, no, I think he's floating in the air. Like one, one of the two is true, okay? And I, yes, I am floating in the air. So that <laughs> proves that wrong. You get what I'm saying, right? So we either have to believe this Jesus or we don't. Jesus is either who he says he is or he's not. The law of non-contradiction applies to reality. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Or is that some sort of fable myth? Is Jesus maybe a lunatic? He's crazy, nutcase, whack job? Or was he a myth? Does people just make this up over the course of time? But he either did or he didn't. It can't be true and then also something that he, some saying that he isn't who he says he is also true. Both of those can't exist. Now, some will say, yeah, I think, I'm not really sure John 3.16 kind of is as absolute and as cut and dry as you say. Well, Jesus himself says, I am the way. He's talking in the context of understanding the path to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And so Jesus himself then wants to say, you know, I know you've explored that there are many different paths, but I'm here to tell you right now that there is one path and I'm, I'm the gatekeeper. And I'm the one in this path. And so if you'd like to engage God the Father, you can engage him through me and I would lovingly love to have you do that. So, so the laws of non-contradiction apply to reality. So no one comes to the Father but by me. Now some of us, I get it, we don't believe that. I would, it's my hope that you would come to believe that in your heart. We would come to believe that th even through your logical studies or your scientific studies or your philosophical studies, that this guy, Jesus, really did do what he said he did. 
and that even 2,000 some on years later, here we are preaching about Jesus Christ, that some of you are here to listen to the message of Jesus, that his story has been so impactful that he's launched the most translated book in human history, the most published book in human history about him, 20,000 times published more than the next closest book, Homer's Iliad, that there, are, there it must be something to this that 2,000 plus years of human history and the fact that we've B.C., A.D., before Christ, Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, that I know that's kind of changing now that we're changing that, but nonetheless that we've uh, structured human history around the coming of Jesus, that there might be something to this than just maybe a quick once-over over five or ten minutes on a blog or website, that we might actually study something like this and engage it personally. And hey, if you come to a conclusion, you come to a conclusion. But to engage it with honesty and to engage it with intentionality and volition, that I think will lead to you coming to believe this in your own heart. I do believe that. Next, and the last issue I have with answering the question, do all religions lead to the same path, with the answer yes, is the Jesus issue. And I'll explain this. I call this the Jesus issue because I believe just Jesus disagrees with that answer. I think as you read the Bible, you come to see that God disagrees the fact, with the fact that all religions lead to the same path. And now that may seem separatistic to you. It may seem uh, intolerant to you. It might seem non-accepting to you. But I hope by the end you'll understand why God does it. I don't think he disagrees because he's a big meanie in the sky and just like, no, you know, like an angry bird. Like, no, that's not true, you know. I don't think that's what he's doing, throwing his brow and wagging the finger. I think he disagrees because I think he knows the truth. I think he knows the truth about the world and its reality, and he wants to help us understand it. This is what God says about himself in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21. God says, declare, the present, and declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? God's saying, who told you this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I the Lord? God's saying, I've been around a long time. I've been saying this forever. I know maybe some of us are just discovering this question now. God is saying, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Was it not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. And if you notice, this statement here has a lowercase g on it. And, God, and there's a specific reason why, because God has a capital G, because it, later it says, there's no God besides me, but a righteous God and Savior. He's talking about himself. There is none besides me. Turn to me, God says, and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. You see what God's doing? He's making a radical, distinct truth claim about the world and the reality. And I know... Sometimes even in our own conversations together with friends, it's kind of, it gets awkward if we disagree. You know what I mean? So, so we kind of try to find ways to kind of always agree with one another. That's kind of what we do today. Uh, trying to find ways to, to figure out how we can both just kind of come to the similar conclusions even if we don't disagree totally. But God here wants to make, leave no gray in this. He says, I am the God and besides me there is no other. God's making an exclusive truth claim. While many people believe in other gods, God is saying, he is the only God. Now, many people think that this old, this is the Old Testament, by the way. We're quoting uh, out of the Old Testament. And so many people will think this Old Testament God is this mean, dictatorial God. And that's actually not true. You see, it's the same God. And I think if you study the Old Testament, you'll come to find a God that is actually after the salvation of his own people through the redemptive story of the Bible. He's actually after their hearts to protect them and preserve them. The whole story is about God sending his son to provide a way, the way that his people, Israel, and then everybody who would believe in Jesus would be reconciled to him. That's what the story of the Bible is about, even the Old Testament. Now, Jesus is sent in the world, okay, as a result of this Old Testament God, and he's God in the flesh. He is fully God and fully man together. He came to live as our example. He lived perfectly, humbly, sacrificially, and he was killed. And he died a death that was meant for humanity. And God counted Jesus' death as anyone who would believe in Jesus' death as their spiritual death. And then whoever would believe in Jesus would receive the perfect life of Christ upon them. This is actually a really powerful love story. And so God is seeking people and so for all who want what I'm about to say in this next phrase, if you want this, you can have it, and that's God wants you to be saved. That God actually is seeking you. He's come and he sought you personally and corporately, us, together for relationship, that he might show you that his way 
is ultimately the best framework to live because he's the creator and he's going to usher you forward into a point where you're in a perfected state and you no longer sin when you die. That's what God is after. That is beautiful and brilliant. This Old Testament God is not mean. We can see that here in verse 17 of our text. For God did not send his son, that's Jesus, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see that? Jesus didn't, God didn't send Jesus into the world in the flesh to condemn people. His chief thought was that people would be saved through him. And so we know that Jesus tells us the truth because he wants us to be saved. Jesus is longing for our saving, our salvation, that we would turn our backs on the human instinct and seek something greater corporately and also with God. That's what's taking place here. You know, the fact of the matter is, I was thinking about this week, that we typically tell the truth to those we love. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you ever had a friend in a bad relationship? Anybody? No? No one? Oh, yeah, never mind. I'll just keep moving on. Okay, so all of you <laughs> have had a friend in a bad relationship, okay? And what's the most loving thing you can do to that person is say, hey, listen, I'm not sure if this guy or this gal is good for you. I think they are actually hurting you. I've seen that your life has gotten a little bit worse, and I, I know that you know, this, is, this isn't going to sound good, but ditch that guy. You know, ditch the joker, okay? There's plenty of men, plenty of women out there. They are making you worse. And so we, we see that with people with unhealthy lifestyles. Hey, I noticed that you've gotten, you've gotten into some drinking or eating or behaviors that I've noticed might not be good for you, and I love you, and I want to tell you the truth about that. Now, in fact, we're not, probably not as honest with people we don't love as much. And if you're here and you live in San Francisco, have you talked to every homeless person you've seen done, doing something shady? Probably not, right? Maybe you help in other ways. But we see people doing things sometimes, and we just move on. We're like, you know what? That's not my issue. I don't know them. And we just kind of turn our back and go, hopefully someone deals with that, right? We're not always, and some of us do, truthfully. Good for you. You guys are awesome. But not everyone engages every wrong they see. Sometimes we don't. We say many people make decisions that are bad for them, and we let them make them because we don't know them. So let me ask you this question. How many of you have been in a relationship or with somebody where you know that telling them the truth about something was going to be something they didn't want to hear? How, just by show of hands, and you knew that when you told them they were going to be upset with you. You've been there. But you still told them, I hope. Why? Because you love them. You want what's best for them. Hey, this is an abusive relationship. You shouldn't be in that. Hey, your boss has been rating you for years. I think you should quit. Hey, wh why don't you move outside the city or into the city? That would be better for you. Have you ever thought about that? Hey, wh why don't you start exercising or working out or eating differently or reading the scriptures? Have you ever tried to share that with somebody and you knew they were going to be upset? Okay, cool. So all of us. This is what God is doing. He is trying to tell us the truth because he knows the truth will be helpful for us. And look at verse 18 with me. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. So whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever believes, or whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And here we hear, again, another exclusive truth claim. Jesus here is saying, if you don't believe in God, you're condemned. If you do believe in God, you're not condemned. He's saying it right here, exclusive. And here we see that Jesus tells us our destiny if we reject the truth. Jesus tells us we uh, our destiny if we reject the truth. Many people will say, do whatever you want, man. What's good for you is good for you. What's, you know, what's good for me is good for me. But what if what makes you happy is bad for you? What if what makes you, you know, when you say do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy, what if what makes you happy is actually something that is harmful? Do you know people like that? Maybe you're somebody like that. I have those relationships in my life. I've been that person where something I'm doing is not good for me. Well, what then? Does the still logic still apply? What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. And who gets to decide that? If the person gets to decide, then whatever I do is good. Right? So there's, there's an issue here. Jesus tells us our destiny if we reject the truth. He says, no. Jesus, there is not multiple ways. What's good for you is not good for you. There is one way, but guess what? This way is safe because there is no condemnation on this road. 
It's a life-giving road. It's a protected road. It's a road that leads to life and abundance and growth and joy. Doesn't all that sound nice? This doesn't sound like a mean God who's, you know, wagging the finger at you or me. It doesn't sound like that. But Jesus is saying, hey, if you lack belief, if you lack belief in Jesus or in me, you will be condemned. The path you lead is not a good one. There are wrong paths here. That path leads off a cliff. That one leads down into a ravine. That one leads to alligators. I hate alligators. That would be the path I would not take. I'm not a big fan. So don't go to that path. Maybe a different one. But you know what I'm saying, right? There's all these different paths. And Jesus is saying, actually, there is this path. Elsewhere in the scriptures, God said, Jesus says that there is a, a narrow path that leads to life, and then there is a wide path that leads to death. Jesus is being exclusive here. What we can't say is that Jesus is right, but then the uh, Unitarian Universalist who says anyone can come to God no matter however they want to come to him is also right as well. One of them is wrong. One of them is wrong. And then look at verse 19 with me, would you? It says, this, and this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And here is the honest truth of our text. The honest truth is Jesus says, I am the light here. It's kind of funny with an analogy like this because we have an analogy of a dark pit and blind people. And Jesus is coming and saying, actually, I'm the light. I'm the light. And so Jesus helps us seek with clarity in the midst of murky world. Do you ever feel like sometimes the world feels a little murky, a little fearful, like you don't quite understand it? There's more going on than you kind of grasp and can understand. Everyone's got their own story. So people are upset and sad and depressed for no reason sometimes or for, for good reason or happy for no reason, and happy for good reason. And everyone's got these different opinions and different thought processes. And God is saying, yeah, this is confusing. Let me turn the light on for you. I'll send Jesus into the world and give you the truth. Now, we know that Jesus helps us see with clarity in the midst of this murky world, but I, I really think that life is often like many of us feeling around in the light switch for the, for the light switch in the dark. You ever done that? You get up in the middle of the night, grab a glass of water or something, and uh, you just moved into a place, and you're like, where, where am I? <laughs> and you're kicking stuff. Over. Just, I'm the only one that kicks stuff in the middle of the night? Goodness gracious. I'm more clumsy than I thought. No support whatsoever. <laughs> and so we're feeling around for this light switch, and Jesus is like, spotlight. <sighs> Let me show you everything. That's where you need to go. Here's the danger. Here's what you should avoid. Here's the path you want to take. And he gives us that. Because I'll be honest with you, if we answer the question, do all religions lead to the same path with yes, they do, then we are walking around in the dark because we haven't, we haven't with clarity thought through our position. And maybe your position is another position. Maybe it's another path, but certainly not all of them can be true. But if, even if we haven't thought that deeply about it, we're wandering around in the dark and we're thinking, and some of that terror kind of creeps in, doesn't it? that sudden dread on your spirit that you realize, you know, this is going to end one day. Like sometimes people go right into a Walmart and don't come out. Life is fragile. And the reality is we all die. And even in a place like San Francisco in the Bay Area, it's so fun and engaging and exciting to do, man, people die. Life ends. And so we have these questions. Origin, man, where did I come from? Where do I come from again? We start asking, maybe this morning you're asking, based on all these shootings, why am I here? Why am I, why am I living the life I'm living? You know, how should I live? What is the right way to live? And then maybe you thought about your destiny. Where am I headed? Where am I headed? I think it's necessary for all of us to spend a deep amount of time thinking of the things outside of this world. A prominent atheist um, yoga teacher and uh, a news correspondent person for NBC News, he says, hey, listen, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but I do admire religion because I think it's important that people will even spend an hour pondering the things outside of this world because there are things that we don't know about. I think the truth about God is made plain to people, and so people know that it's an important question to ask. So, my challenge for us today, will we open our eyes and allow Jesus to turn on the light for us in our lives? Will we see clearly? Will we ask him for the truth? 
And just so you know, there is true and there are falsities. There are both. And Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes from the, through the Father, to the Father but by me, nobody. And that is a message of love, not hostility. That is a message of tremendous care and love for people. Come to me. This is the path. Don't you see? Let me turn the light on for you. I know it's a dark world. I know there's varying perspectives. This is the truth. There's no judgment here. I, I'm, I've, come, I've come to love you for those in Christ. That's beautiful. As far as Jesus is concerned, he is the truth. His truth brings real answers in the midst of darkness and in the midst of terror. And so today I want to invite you to engage him in a way maybe you haven't. Let's pray.